So, um, it's my honor to introduce this year's Free Thinkers of the Year awards, which are typically reserved for plaintiffs and litigants who have won lawsuits to end entanglements between religion and government. It includes a plaque and a $1,000 honorarium. This year, we have multiple winners. They are plaintiffs in two of the Freedom from Religion Foundation's recent successful lawsuits. And I'm going to call on our Alabama plaintiffs first. So if you guys could please come up to the stage as I introduce your lawsuit. That would be helpful. Oh, they're over there. So just before the 2020 election, we filed a federal lawsuit challenging an egregious mandatory religious oath which citizens in Alabama had to swear in order to register to vote. And here's a fun fact, Alabama was the only state to require voters to sign this religious oath in registering to vote. FFRF attorneys Patrick Elliott and Elizabeth Cavell were the attorneys in this lawsuit, and I'm happy to report that we won that lawsuit in April of this year. Sam had mentioned that earlier this morning. This significant victory was possible only because of these local plaintiffs who stood up publicly to challenge this religious test. So, um, I'm going to introduce them one by one, and I would like you to hold your applause until we're all done here. So first, we're going to congratulate and thank Robert Corker. Thank you. There we go. You can take them out. Of the... Yeah, I got it. And then Chris Nelson and Heather Coleman Nelson. And then Randall Cragen. So speaking on behalf of the plaintiffs this year will be Randall Cragen. Randall is a visiting assistant professor at Birmingham Southern College in Alabama. He received his master's and PhD in economics at Clemson University. He researches how the contraceptive ecosystem affects fertility, education, career choices, and other life outcomes. So please welcome Randall. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit about why I think this case was important. So this certainly was not a really groundbreaking case. It didn't set new precedent. Uh, it wasn't something that should have had a big impact, say, on national level politics in the US. But I think that part of why it matters is that it was not new. So when I moved to Alabama three years ago, uh, I went to register to vote, and I found that I had to sign this oath that required that I made some religious statement. I was not willing to do that. I thought that would have been dishonest. It would have felt to me like I was betraying some of my values. And so I contacted the Secretary of State's office and asked them how I should go about registering to vote when I was not willing to sign this form. Because I knew that this had already been addressed by courts, that courts had already decided that they had to have some alternative. But the response that I got from the Secretary of State's office was, there is no alternative. If you modify this form, if you strike out those words, your registration will be rejected and you will not be allowed to vote. So they told me that I was not allowed to participate in the political system unless I made this religious claim, even though it had already been established by courts that they could not do that. So why does that happen? Right. So after that, I went about looking for some representation. I contacted multiple attorneys and said, I need some help with this. And basically, everyone said, well, we don't have any expertise in this. There's not much we can do, and we're not willing to take this on. 
And I had sort of given up hope on this. I'd said, well, I guess I'm just gonna have to deal with the fact that I am not a full participant in Alabama society. Uh, and then a friend said, well, why don't you contact FFRF? And I was not a member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation at the time, but I am now. And the reason is that I got a response from them saying, this is important and we want to help you. Okay. So what happened then? Well, they changed the form. So now you can strike out those words, and there's also a box that you can check to say, I'm not willing to agree to this religious oath. And I have to wonder why it is that the Secretary of State of Alabama, uh, John Merrill, although I don't know how involved he was individually in this decision, I have to wonder why he thought it was a good idea to change the form to be more complicated instead of just getting rid of it. There's no reason it needed to be in there, none at all. It serves no purpose. There's no reason for administrative purposes or anything else that those words needed to be there. But instead, they made the process harder and more confusing just to try to keep that language there. So even though this was a victory in some sense where we, now I'm allowed to register to vote, which is excellent because I want to vote. There's still this sense that I am not a full member of Alabama society because it is owned by Christians, because they are the default. And you don't have to look very far to see this. So in some of the conversations I had with people, they told me things, well, not with me, sorry. When they didn't know that I was a plaintiff, uh, they would say things like, why is this organization from Wisconsin coming into Alabama and trying to change our way of life? And I don't know who this our is, because I live there, this is my way of life, and I just wanted to live my way of life. And yet, people don't see it that way. It's very common, it seems like, for people to say, well, this is a religious state, this is a Christian state, Alabama is a Christian place, and the people are Christian. But only some are. In conversations in recent months, I heard people say things like, uh, why are people coming into Utah to uh, oh, sorry, I grew up Mormon. I should have probably led with that. Uh, so I talked with a lot of Mormons. Um, and I heard people saying things like, well, why are people coming into our state and trick-or-treating on Sunday? This is our state. Don't they know that this is a Mormon community? In other words, we are the default, we are in control, and this society is built for us. Sure, yes, I am now allowed to register to vote, but that's not enough. Inclusion is not enough. Accommodations are not enough. Every person deserves to have full ownership of society. And that's true for in cases of religion, it's true for cases of, of race, and all kinds of other things. And when we treat this like it's just a thing that we have to deal with because it's a minor issue where we have to sign a form, that's not gonna change. And so I'm really glad that FFRF took this case and made it me feel like I actually had a voice and could do something about it. So thank you so much. Thank you, I hope that inspires some of you. Um, if we had been able to meet in person last year, we would have honored the next set of Victoria plaint victorious plaintiffs there. The next set of honorees, please come up to the stage as I introduce the case. In 2015, FFR FFRF, our chapter, Central Florida Free Thought Community, and a coalition of national and local groups plus five individuals sued over censorship of secular invocations in Brevard County, Florida. Our plaintiffs won that case, including an appeal to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. All five individuals are receiving this award. Two, however, Ronald Gordon and Chase Hansel could not make it. So the next set of our 2021 Freethinkers of the Year are Keith Betcher, oh please hold your applause until the end.
Jeffrey Coberl. and David Williamson. Please give them a round of applause. So Jeffrey wanted to say a few words. Um, so I'm gonna give him the floor for a minute or two. Hi, uh, I inadvertently talked myself into speaking last night. So. Um, just to relate a quick anecdote, why am I here? Uh, I was not really enthusiastic about jumping into this as a police officer employed by a chief who's appointed by local politicians in a very conservative, very Christian area of the country. Um, the idea of suing local politicians as an atheist, I was apprehensive, I was scared. So one day my daughter came up to me and she said, Dad, I'm having trouble with um, something at school. I need your advice. She said some of her friends were bullying other people and it made her uncomfortable and she wanted to know what she could do. And I said, well, if you hang out with them, you're, you might as well be bull bullying them too because that's, there's, there's no difference. So you can, you can do that or you can walk away. But I said, the best thing to do is speak up and say something because that's how you stop them. Because, you know, and, and, and she said, well, I'm, I'm afraid about what would happen. And I said, yeah. I said, well, bullying thrives on fear. So she did it and she came back and she told me about it. She was very proud. And uh, it occurred to me, I should take my own advice. And, and I did, and I'm glad I did. So my, my suggestion to you is don't let, fear, don't let fear inform your actions and live in a way that'll make your daughters proud. So now to tell us more, including a recent very positive ending to this long-standing litigation is our good friend and inspirational activist, David Williamson. David is the co-founder of our Central Florida chapter and has built a thriving secular community in the Orlando area. He has served on the Central Florida Commission on Religious Freedom and the Interfaith Council of Central Florida. He's the secretary of the Florida Humanist Association and the co-coordinator of the biennial conference, Free Flow. Welcome, David. Thanks, Rebecca. Of all the effort that uh, went into the victory in this case, the hardest work done by far was done by attorneys. Uh, the passion the FFRF legal staff has for their work and our shared interest in secular government is truly remarkable. And the best measure of this isn't just their successes, but in the longevity of the team that they've built. So I want to acknowledge Rebecca Marker for her leadership of the fabulous team of attorneys at FFRF. Rebecca was involved in our case. I also saw work done by Andrew Seidel, who, while this case was moving through the courts, went from being Florida's legal resource on the FFRF legal team to, to director of strategic response for FFRF. So some of us just gained a lot of gray hair, but Andrew gained a, a pretty cool title with that, uh, with that process. Uh, and no gray hairs yet, um, which is kind of odd. But he's got a couple of kids now that he didn't have when we started, so those will be, those will be on the way very soon, those gray hairs. Um, the lead attorney in this case was Alex Luchinitzer at Americans United for Separation for Church and State. They had staff working on the case as well. Um, we also had support from ACLU and ACLU of Florida. So I want to be sure to thank all involved for their efforts. Um, and I also need to acknowledge Annie Laurie and Dan who have supported our chapter at every step and who continue to support the growing FFRF legal team. Um, so much of what we heard today and will tomorrow depends on those fights that you inspire them to fight on your behalf and vice versa. Um, the work that Annie Laurie and Dan and others that lead national organizations have allowed the collaborations that are continuing to happen more and more in the recent years, so that's fantastic. Uh, and since local groups are truly the backbone of local activism, I want to also acknowledge the three organizational plaintiffs. So those groups are the Humanist Community of the Space Coast, the Space Coast Free Thought Association, also known as the Brevard Area Atheists, and the Central Florida Free Thought Community, or CFFC, where I serve. The power we wield, and especially the power sharing we can do at the local level, is more valuable than even a well-written letter by a constitutional attorney. And the attorneys will tell you this as well. Also with us today, we have a supermajority, if we were going to be voting, of the CFFC Board of Directors. I want to thank them for their support of this litigation as well. All of us involved 
we joined a battle against government prayer that was already well underway. Some of you well know that just a few short years ago, Annie Laurie was a college student at the University of Madison, or University of Wisconsin in Madison. And while she was but a lowly sophomore, she helped found the Freedom From Religion Foundation because of the prayers that they encountered when they went to interact with their local city and county governments. So this is truly the first issue on which the Freedom From Religion Foundation has been working, and I thought that was notable. While our 11th Circuit victory allows atheists to conduct invocations alongside others, unfortunately, not all of the recent government prayer cases have gone so well. We heard a little bit about that earlier. In some venues, there is still inequality and discrimination against atheists and others. Our own experiences, even since this victory in Brevard, has shown that by no means have we fixed Florida's prayer problem yet. But we've done many good things outside the courts as well. We don't just sue people, right? That's how we get into the news, and it makes it look like that's all we do at the local level and at the national level, but there's so much more than that. Since we sent those first letters requesting inclusion in Brevard and others in 2014, our FFRF chapter, the CFFC, has conducted many invocations. This initiative for secular, humanistic invocations has, in my opinion, been the most successful one our chapter has pursued since we were established nine years ago. We've even made it possible for there to be a secular invocation in the Florida House of Representatives in 2018. So far, we've offered inclusive secular invocations in 23 city and county venues with the help of 41 different invocators, including Randa Black, whom you'll hear from later today. And as of earlier this month, the CFFC has conducted 107 invocations in Central Florida. I want to take a moment to give very special thanks to my partner in good trouble and everything else, Jocelyn Williamson. She really, <laughs> she really drives this initiative uh, and even writes many of the invocations that are given um, by her and others, including myself. So um, our website is a great place to find out more, cflfreethought.org. Each of those are transcribed, all of those there and many others from around the country. Um, for anyone who wants to plagiarize them, please feel free. There are no new ideas, just recycled ones that you can't remember where you got them. The CFSC has made one of our goals to ensure that in every local government meeting where legislative prayer is occurring, there will be an atheist giving secular invocations. This project really has engaged our fans and followers and has helped others, including our elected officials, to know that we exist, to understand that we care about local government, and most importantly, to learn that we have something positive to offer, something in my opinion that is far superior to the exclusive sectarian Christian prayers that open these meetings in the most divisive way possible by starting with religion. But the Brevard County Commissioners liked it that way. And for the five and a half years of litigation, the county made a bet. They bet a lot of other people's money that the court would agree that atheists didn't belong. And the court proved them wrong. So how much did it cost them to try and keep us out? Let's watch the video of Brevard's first secular invocation and try not to be distracted by the numbers that you'll see uh, in just a minute on the screen. And this was back in January of 2021. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today and for the honor of solemnizing your meeting on behalf of the uh, citizens of the county. And I want to thank you and your staff in particular for uh, their hard work during this challenging period. Uh, keeping us all safe. There's so much time available to us in life, and the fact that all of you have dedicated so much of yours is a, a credit to um, the service you do, and we really appreciate it. Thomas Jefferson wrote that government is the strongest of which everyone feels themselves a part. As we begin the day in service together, we remember the solemn responsibility we have to our shared community. With that in mind, we remember all those who live in or visit the community and who will be affected by the decisions made here today, possibly for generations to come. Whether visiting the Space Coast for just a day as a visitor to a local beach or boutique, or for an entire career of public service. While we are sometimes participants in it, we are always benefactors of our democracy and the important work of bodies such as this. Knowing that our words, our decisions, and our actions directly impact so many others, we strive to make compassion the foundation for our important work here today, 
and that we serve with integrity and kindness towards one another and to all those you serve as representatives in local government. Together, let's embody the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, the good neighbors look beyond the external accidents and discerns those inner qualities that make all of us human and therefore family. May we strive for balance between listening and reflecting, between speaking and acting. Finally, let us incline our ears toward reason, apply our heart to understanding, and seek knowledge we can use to find common ground among the citizens for the betterment of the county. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You know why that sounded like a prayer? Because religious people took speeches like that and pointed them upward. That's the only difference. So Brevard bet a lot of money and lost. They paid nearly half a million dollars for that invocation for it not to happen. But it happened anyway. And another again by my co-plaintiff Keith back in July. With that settlement, our attorneys were paid for at least some of their time the plaintiff organizations and individuals received a small amount of damages, and the world is a better place for everyone, except the taxpayers of Brevard County. Insurance claims covered the settlement, but that nearly half a million dollars did not include the effort of the county staff and outside counsel they hired that was spent trying to preserve the discriminatory practice they had in place. But there's so much more to local activism than lawsuits, and our victories are most cost-effective when they don't go to court. Everyone wins when we don't go to court. So I want to encourage you to continue to push back against the mythology of Christian nationalists, to continue to fight for in inclusion, to continue to demand for the equal rights for non-believers and anyone else who's not in the majority. We need all the friends we can get. You never know which of those letters the FFRF legal team writes that will turn into a federal case and an important legal victory. All victories are worth celebrating. But remember, equal access for religious perspectives is not an acceptable alternative to a secular government. It's a temporary condition in which we must survive while we fight for the first and most fundamental freedom enshrined in our Constitution, freedom from religion. Thank you. We have about five minutes, so um, if anybody has questions for these plaintiffs, you can go ahead and find yourself your way to the mic. Um, and I'm sure David would be happy to take questions. And Randall, I don't know where he ended up, but he's over there. Okay. Come on up, David. All right, there is one question. Maybe more. For, for the Florida invocations, do you have a, a booklet of them, or are they online? So if somebody else wants to do the same thing, you provide a model for us to copy from. We, we don't have a booklet, because I think that involves paper, and I don't know that that exists anymore. So <laughs> we, we do. I know some of you read on paper still. I, I get it. Um, we don't. We have a, uh, a website that has all the invocations that we found from before about four or five years ago from around the country and everyone that we've ever done since 2014. So this goes all the way back to Herb Silmerman in, in 2003 and everything uh, since then up to a certain point and then we just couldn't track them all mostly because the media wasn't covering it. So we do have all the invocations. You can see a lot of repetitive themes there and we welcome you to take that language and use it for yourself. Where is it? Uh, CFLfreethought.org. If you, if you Google Central Florida Three Thought Community Invocations, it should come up right away. Okay, m my question was sort of answered by your last sentence or two, where you said that you think it's second best to have equality in invocations, but better to have secular government. So I wanted to ask, you know, if you hadn't said that, why we should have any invocations at all, which seems to me as a religious practice in general, and given your answer, uh, has have you or RFF taken uh, steps towards getting government to be secular across the board? Well, on this one issue in particular, I don't want to speak more broadly at, at this moment, but on this one issue, the first question that's asked by most of the national organizations, when, or not asked but posed, is you, you don't need to have these invocations. You don't need to have these prayers. But if you're going to do it, which the law allows now, as of 2014 in the Greece case, 
you're going to have to include everyone. And the silver lining of the Greece case was that they said the word atheists in the decision that we called that out to say, you have to let us in. And it's usually worked. Yeah, which, which case was this? I'm not familiar. Town of Greece versus Galloway. It was referred to earlier, and one of the plaintiffs, Linda Stevens, oh. is here as well. I see, thank you. You alluded to earlier that there is a very strong effect from having a local group, uh, people who are involved in the community, directly appealing to their government rather than just going through lawyers, right? Obviously, the first thing you want to do is get the people local involved. Uh, I myself live in a community that does not have a local chapter affiliated with FFRF. I understand that you've been instrumental in building a chapter in the central Florida area. Um, I think that there are many people here who would be interested in finding what do you have to do, uh, what are the keys to success in building a successful local chapter if you're starting from square one and there's nothing? So I, I don't think I can answer that question in full right now, but I will say it's not as hard as it seems, and it doesn't require incorporation just to get to work. You can actually just get together on meetup.com. That is the, by far the best um, social media outlet, very hands-off, perfect for the demographic of generally middle age and above. It's not got a lot of younger people there, which is a downside. But if you go to meetup.com and create a group around the subject of separation between religion and government, you will find people in your local area that are interested. Of those people, a certain amount will end up supporting what you do. Um, but a lot of times you have to really revolve that around socializing and getting to know and breaking bread and drinking coffee and cocktails with people to get to know them better and building a social network that you can use for advocacy and activism. So that's a dumbed down version of a three hour talk. Thank you. Good question.